my kids tragically lost a piece of their innocence on October 7th, even from the safety of a bomb shelter. They lost a piece of their innocence. And that was really horrible for me as a mother. Um, and the best thing that I knew how to do was to put them to work, to make them feel like they could be a part of the solution in some small way. Hello and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. Not all heroes wear capes, not all advocates wear suits, some wear high-end fashion, and they use that fashion to promote their advocacy. Until recently, Lizzie Savetsky was a fashion blogger using her phenomenal platform on social media to just talk about fashion. But even before October 7th, she underwent a shift to become one of the most influential, outspoken, and active voices for Israel and the Jewish people online, reaching out to her hundreds of thousands of followers. We first met in New York months ago during the war, and I'm so happy to host her here in the State of the Nation studio to talk about her work fighting for Israel through her unconventional platform. Together we talk about what it means to build brand Israel, how she's talking to her children about this war and how to talk to children about what is happening. And we talk about having the courage to speak your truth even when you'll face a backlash and pay a professional and social price because you know the things that are truly worth standing up for and fighting for, for the sake of your future and your children's future. Welcome. It's a state of a nation. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. What happens when the four day pause? Have you resolved it? Where does this go? You can't why Lizzie Savetsky, welcome to State of a Nation. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I came all the way to Israel just to be on this podcast. <laughs> well, you came here for a mix of producing content, family vacation in the shadow of. We're expecting, as we record this, potentially an Iranian missile attack. What has it been like to vacation here with your family as you know that the situation can, can heat up at any moment? Well, it seems only appropriate because our last family vacation to Israel was on October 7th. Oof. And we, were, we spent our last day uh, as a family in the bomb shelter in Jerusalem. My kids first time in a bomb shelter, actually my first time in a bomb shelter. So, you know, um, it feels to us not normal in any way, but it, so much of that day has shaped our past year as a family and all the work that we do together. And so now being here during this critical point, it seems, of course, of course God would put us here now. Um, but, you know, in spite of it all, we've been able to really have the most meaningful week and a half plus here. And, you know, my kids love Israel and just getting to, um, you know, immerse ourselves in the resilience and the strength and the beauty of this country. There's no place in the world I'd rather be. There, like, we could have gone anywhere. There's nowhere else I would want to go besides That's here. That's really heartwarming to hear. And you really have been on a journey. You together with your family, you personally. That's what I wanted to talk to you about here because you've moved from being a fashion blogger to becoming one of the more vocal and active influencers in the pro-Israel space on social media. And I'm wondering, how did that awakening happen? When did you begin to transition from doing fashion to being warrior for Israel online? So it, um, it was really, you know when you can look back at your life and there's like one day or one moment where everything changed? I know you have this too. So um, it was 2021, uh, it was right after is Israel was pummeled uh, by Hamas rockets. And within hours from Israel's response, it was like the world turned against us. Um, and it was the first time I had seen in my space, in the digital space on Instagram, so many people that I considered to be colleagues, friends, allies, coming out with this false propaganda against Israel. And I was shook. I didn't know how to handle it. Um, there, I had had no training. I didn't consider myself to be an expert in the field of Middle Eastern politics or how to talk about these things. Um, but I just noticed that there was nobody really stepping up to the plate in my position to defend Israel uh, on, in the information world, on, in the information war. 
So I um, got a text from a friend who was here in Israel, and she said, Lizzie, we really need your voice right now. And I said, what am I supposed to say? And she said, you were made for this moment, it will come to you. And I made this post, wrapped myself in the Israeli flag and made a whole post about why I stand with Israel, why, um, you know, dispelling all these lies that we've been seeing all over social media. And uh, it really opened up a can of worms. Like I went to bed that night and I woke up with hundreds of death threats. And I had never received a death threat in my life. Um, and then there were other consequences as well. I lost followers. I um, was, you know, being just cursed out by people that I had loved and respected. And, um, and I got dropped by my management company because I was no longer marketable. So um, I knew at that point that I really either was going to try to run backwards and pretend like it never happened, or I was going to just completely dive in head first. And that's what I decided to do. Um, and I was lucky in the sense that I had a good two and a half years leading up to October 7th, learning how to advocate online. Um, because like I said, there was no manual for how to do that. And um, I really um, spent those two and a half years learning about all the talking points, learning uh, what best resonated with people on social media. And um, I really felt like, you know, when I was sitting in that bomb shelter with my husband that God put me in this place here in Israel during the most brutal day in Israel's history or the most sadistic day in Israel's history for a reason. And um, I've just been going nonstop like you. Which makes you a real pioneer in this space because since October 7th, I know so many people have suddenly felt betrayed by liberal circles and you're saying you felt that betrayal two years before October 7th. People are experiencing death threats and intimidation and you're saying you had this two years before October 7th. You had this pushback and the professional price that people are afraid to pay now if they speak up for Israel, you're saying you had that before October 7th and now speaking up for Israel online has become your shtick. I mean, you have put your 300 and what is it, 80, 90,000 followers on Instagram at the service of the state of Israel. Yeah, I felt, um in a way, like it was a gift to have that cleaning of house, um, pri much, you know, pretty far prior to this moment, um, getting rid of all the followers that had no interest in this or didn't agree with me, um, and uh, really rebranding myself in a way. It wasn't intentional. I didn't like sit down and think of how I was going to rebrand or come up with a, a st strategy or a plan. I just spoke from my heart and but I mean you know, do you have a moment when, when suddenly you see I mean how many followers dropped at the beginning about 30,000 about 30,000 amazing you know when I was in New York and we met the first time I filmed content with Casey Neistat as well until recently big YouTube name no Israel content I think he lost over 100,000 followers just because he filmed a reel with me because people were so upset that suddenly he was speaking up for Israel but like you he says I don't care, screw them. And I, I'm wondering, did, did yeah. you have this moment where you're going, what am I doing? Why am I sacrificing this brand that I have built for the sake of this country halfway across the sea when it's so much easier to say, actually, that has nothing to do with me. I'm, I'm gonna go back to fashion. Sorry, I made a mistake. I never had that moment. I, if anything, every follower that I lost, every hate message that I got only reiterated how important this work was and how important it was that I make this shift and use my voice and my platform that I feel like I have a responsibility to use for my people in my homeland. Um, because to me, Israel is not this country across the world. It is a part of me and the fabric of my being. And I don't feel like I can be separated from my passion for Israel and my love for my people. When did this start? Uh, more specifically, was this the first time you experienced anti-Semitism or, or growing up in Texas, did you experience that as a child? Well, I never experienced overt anti-Semitism. Um, I had much more, uh, it was less intentional. It would be like, well, sweetie, I pray for your soul every night that Jesus will still accept you into heaven because you're a good person, <laughs> you know, and um, it was more like that. 
Um, not like I want to kill you because you're Jewish, which I get now. Um, I'm praying for your soul is the least bad kind of anti-Semitism there is. Literally. May all anti-Semites pray for our souls. Yeah, literally. I'll take their, I'll take their prayers, you know. Um, but growing up around so few Jews really did pave the way for what I do now. Obviously, I can only see this in retrospect, but because I was one of two Jews in my class my whole way through school in Fort Worth, Texas, um, I, in a way, made myself like this ambassador for the Jewish people. Like all the kids would come to me with their questions about the holidays. And, you know, I wouldn't have known the answers, but I never took my Jewish identity for granted because it made me different. It was something that nobody else was. And so I had to educate myself so I could educate my peers and even educate my teachers at times. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like it really did kind of lay the groundwork for me becoming a self-proclaimed spokesperson for the Jewish people. And that's fascinating. So you find yourself becoming an advocate for Israel and the Jewish people because your kids, your, your, your fellow classmates are coming to you with questions and yeah. suddenly you say, wow, it's on me. Like I have to give them the answers because if I don't, no one else will, or, else or, will. Or, or the bad people are going to give them the bad answers. Yeah, and I mean, I remember as young as third grade, talking to my classmates about the Holocaust um, and, you know, having a deep understanding of the fact that my people were killed simply for being born. Um, and, you know, I don't know that if I had grown up around in the uniformity of fellow Jews that I would have had that real understanding of what that really meant. Maybe I would have, but I think I had it even stronger because I was like the sole representative. And so having been talking to your classmates about the Holocaust in third grade and experiencing the uh, anti-Semitism when you start speaking up for Israel more recently, what we've been seeing since October 7th didn't come as a surprise to you. It didn't come as a surprise, but it did, um, and like, I guess in, in one sense it didn't come as a surprise, but I think the theory and the reality are two very different things. When you're feeling it, and you're seeing it in such mainstream, widely accepted places. It's uh, like, you know, just watching the media propagate against Israel. Um, you see how the Holocaust could have happened, but it's still shocking to watch it. You've made this transition from being a fashion blogger to advocating for Israel. But it's not a sharp transition because so much of the fashion and the glamour is part of the Lizzie Savetsky brand in advocating for Israel. And I'm wondering whether, whether you think that that focus on fashion and beauty and glamour means that maybe you're not taken as seriously as you think you should be. Is that, is that, is that your sense? You know, I, it's something that I have struggled with. Um, but I've always felt like my platform is a place where I show up as myself. Whatever I'm feeling, whatever um, seems authentic to me at the time. And I don't want to be one layer or one note. Um, I'm a very multifaceted person, and I don't want to have to apologize for these parts of myself that really matter to me. And, you know, I, I grew up singing on a country music show and competing in pageants, and I, um, I just have so many parts of myself that I think all make me who I am and the appeal is not just because I know how to talk about Israel. I think there are so many different as assets that I have that um, draw people in. And so um, as much as I go back and forth on it and you know, I try to be strategic. Like if I'm showing up to Fox News, I'm gonna wear a suit or like a solid color dress. I'm not gonna show up in a crop top, but you know, I'm in Israel right now, so it's okay to wear a crop top. Um, but I think fashion... And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm the one here in a suit. <laughs> exactly. But this is your uniform. You're like a cartoon character. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, but I think that fashion actually and uh, appearance in general have a very important place that the Jewish people tend to neglect. Um, I think that a lot of times we get too focused on the message and not focused enough on the packaging. And if we look at the people that are propagating against us, they're amazing with the packaging. And I actually wrote an article about this in the book that I saw on your bookshelf. But um, 
I don't think that we should be neglecting fashion and beauty and um, in general, just the, the sparkle of our message, because I think that that's when we really start to lose the propaganda war, the PR war. This is a really intriguing point because the other side has been very effective with its branding. Look at the kefir. The kefir has become a fashion statement totally. on the other side. They have this branding, this aesthetic, and you're saying that's something that's actually missing in the pro-Israel yeah. space. And I'm wondering what, uh, how does Israel begin to fight back in terms of having an aesthetic yeah. that appeals not to try to cover something up, you make something pretty to cover up a bad situation, but in order to have an aesthetic that makes a cause something that people identify with in the way that the kafir has, for reasons I don't understand, made the Palestinian cause so cool uh, among you know, the college tentifada. So I'll tell you, after October 7th, um, I went into my own version of a war room I, got, I landed back in America on October 9th, and um, I went to work. And I w filmed all my videos up against this gray wall in the common conference room in my building. And every day I would wear like a different message on a T-shirt. Um, and it wasn't necessarily fashion, but um, I, I, you know, what does one wear? I didn't. I'm not going to put on a business suit like you. But I, I, had, I wake up in the morning and it's like Dexter's laboratory, the identical suits that I take yeah. off, and it's always a blue suit with a white shirt. But you have a different outfit every yeah, day. Yeah. So I started. So what wearing do you wear? What do you, what do you yeah. wear after the beginning of a war? So I started wearing all these different sweatshirts and t-shirts that had different messages on them, and then it became this thing where people started sending them to me, like, you know, Am Yisrael Chai or F Hamas or whatever it was. But I was trying to figure out what to wear when I would make these videos. And I also, I didn't want to be so formal. I wanted it to be like, hi, I'm your friend Lizzie, and I'm here to educate you about this current event you need to know about today. Or I'm here to talk to you about why we haven't had a two-state solution or, you know, whatever the serious content may be. I want to deliver it in an accessible way that's not intimidating to people where they feel like, oh, now I understand something that has been made so complex. And so by wearing these, you know, Sometimes funny, sometimes, you know, whatever it was, it kind of looked like pajamas, you know, a sweatshirt that you sleep in. Um, I think it, it. I remember the first time we filmed content together when, when I came to New York, you had this amazing punk Golda Meir sweatshirt as yeah. well. Yeah, totally. So, you know, that just sort of became my outfit. And, um, and I think it, it actually, it worked. And people were always like, oh, Lizzie, you have the, the best Israel swag or the best, you know, and I just, I feel like um, I'm not going to, I don't know. I think we could do a better job with our branding. And I think it has become, you know, but the problem with us is we're always just trying to survive. So there's never been a moment where we said, maybe we should prioritize our packaging. Maybe we should prioritize PR. I think it's only now that we're really seeing people step up to the plate and understand how important this information war is. Um, and that comes with like the swag, you know? So tell me, what are you wearing now? What are the hidden <laughs> messages in the attire you've chosen to wear? So today? right now I'm wearing this outfit from Desert Queen, which is an Israeli brand. Um, I, you know, I've been trying to only wear Israeli or Zionist designers. Um, and then my bracelets are the Healers collection. What my energy healer is a, uh, is a Haredi woman who lives in Jerusalem. And uh, yeah, so. There's a message that you're sending here, first of all, about the importance of packaging and having a shirt that has a message on it. But I think there's something a bit deeper about how we approach living through this horrible period. Because for some people, the focus on fashion and glamour might be off-putting because they think, oh, this is fashion blogger and why should we take her seriously, yeah. right? But there will be other people who say, this is a war. The situation is terrible. Soldiers are dying. There are rockets. There are still hostages trapped in Gaza. Why are you investing in the makeup and the clothing and the fashion? We should be sitting shiva until this crisis is over. And I'm wondering, like, as you wake up every day, and focus on appearance and fashion and makeup. What is your approach to how we need to get through yeah. this moment, despite well, despite everything? I mean, I had a couple weeks where I like barely washed my hair unless I had to <laughs> go on the news. Um, 
But I think of it like, like a news anchor. They have to like show up and go to work. And that's, you know, what I do, but mine is just, I film on my phone and I produce all my own content. Um, but I'm still putting a face forward. Um, and you know, that's, that's important. It's the, it's a, it's all about of the, it's all about the delivery. And I don't think that it means that I'm not taking this very seriously. I think, in fact, it means that I am taking it seriously. Um, and it's, you know, we have to show up and be who we are and deliver the message all at the same time. Um, because if I stop being myself, then why is my delivery of the message any different from anyone else's? There's this dissonance between, on the one hand, the horrible situation that there is a war and the fashion. But also there's a dissonance, you know, something here that might not work in, in, in people's minds. On the one hand, you have, you know, the focus on the glamour and the beautiful clothes. On the other hand, you want orthodox. Yeah. And the weekly Pasha that you film with your children on Instagram is a great source of Jewish wisdom for the neshama. Now, I'm not saying there's a contrast here or these two things don't work. Yeah. But, but it isn't exactly the look that one identifies with right. the standard stereotypical modern, modern orthodox. orthodox woman. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I get, and this is nothing new for me. Since for years, I've gotten backlash from the more uh, religious people or, you know, pass, tr passing judgment on how I dress or um, the kind of content I'm putting out there, um, telling me to cover up, telling me to be more modest. But, you know, I just, I can't apologize for being myself. I am who I am. And, you know, I, just because I dress a certain way or promote a certain Israeli fashion designer that's not necessarily modest doesn't mean that I'm not as spiritually tapped in to God. You know, I feel like, I really feel like my relationship with God is so deeply personal and everyone's is so deeply personal. And so who is anyone else to look in from the outside and say, um, and, and pass judgment about the external, you know? For me, it's, they can coexist. And that's such an important message, I think, for Israel as well, the idea that we are who we are and the world doesn't need to interfere and tell us, why don't you think this? Why don't you do that? We are who we are. We own it. We feel yeah. content and, and, and we just need to be ourselves. You've been here on a family vacation, but you've also been producing a lot of content and pumping it out at a very high frequency. <laughs> I'm wondering, what have you learned while you're here? Has there been anything that's surprised you as you've ventured out to film content? Yeah, so um, it's we've done so much. Um, and part of my motivation to come here with my kids was, you know, I wanted us to be able to give back, whether it was going to Schneider Hospital to visit the kids there, um, to we went, we went to visit an orphanage in Netanya, my girls and I, that was a very intense day. Um, because, you know, the, like those two situations specifically, um, there are people in Israel that need our help before, during, and after the war. And it can be easy to forget about them when we're so busy with the urgency of our soldiers and their needs or um, the hostage families and their needs. You know, we can't neglect the whole other part of uh, the country that also needs our love and care. Um, so, you know, it's been important to me to like remember those people and to show my kids that this is what we do. We are of service, we give back, we take care of our family. Um, we, uh, you know, so my daughter, uh, she's gonna be 12 in November. She's about to have her bat mitzvah. Oh, that's tough. Thank you. And she had been asking me to go visit Nova, the Nova site. Um, and I was really nervous about taking her there because I felt like she's 11, you know, and she- Is this age appropriate? Yeah, it's, it's a heavy, heavy place. When I came here in February, it was, I visited some of the kibbutzim and I, you know, I, I saw a lot of really heavy things, it, soldiers that were injured in the hospital, but Nova, it's like standing on holy ground. 
We have a clip here of you with your daughter Stella. Let's watch your experience together at the site of the Nova Massacre. Here, we're standing on very holy ground right now because this is the place where people were killed just for being Jewish. You know from my bat mitzvah, I asked you if we can go to Auschwitz. This is the Auschwitz of my time. Difficult to watch, I'm getting a chill. And you produce a lot of your content with your children. And, and a lot of people choose to keep their children out of their social media profiles. You've taken a very different direction. They are there. They are part of your journey of discovery. And I bet you're debating with yourself, like how much do you want to expose a 12 year old to? How much yeah. can she really take on? Well, you know, one of the hardest conversations that I've had with my kids was after October 7th, being in um, just the hotel lobby and all of the chaos and hearing, um, hearing things, for example, my Stella, my daughter, asked me, Mommy, what is rape? And I never thought that I would have to have that conversation with my 11-year-old child. She was 10 at the time. Um, and how do I parent through this? In the same way that there was no manual for being an advocate on social media, going from being a fashion blogger to this, there, there's no manual for how to parent through this. What did you tell her? I was honest with her. Um, I told her, you know, that it's when someone's body is violated um, barbarically in a way that they don't want. Um, and she understood. Um, and actually, we took it to the Torah um, to when, I believe it's Dina, mm -hmm. was, um, was raped in the Parsha. And I, we spoke about that, um, which I think probably a lot of people find very interesting that I'm sitting here in a crop top talking, tell, teaching my children about, you know, about these horrible things through the lens of the Torah. But um, thank God we have that. You know, it's been an amazing source of comfort for me and also an amazing tool for me to talk to my kids through these times. What advice would you give to other parents who are wondering how to broach this subject with children who are old enough to understand, but not really old enough to understand, if you get what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that I would have made the choices that I've made um, if my kids had not tragically lost a piece of their innocence on October 7th. Even from the safety of a bomb shelter, they lost a piece of their innocence. And that was really horrible for me as a mother. Um, and the best thing that I knew how to do was to put them to work to make them feel like they could be a part of the solution in some small way. And that's what we've done. And I think, you know, no matter how much your kids know, um, the best education is being of service, giving back. And I always meet them where they are. I'm not gonna bring up these subjects to them, but when they bring them up to me, I'm always honest um, because I think that they deserve that. You know, they've lived through a lot and they're people, you know, I, I don't think that I should patronize them. Um, but I, of course they should know that I am always going to love and support them and hold their hand through learning about these horrors. Again, I'm not going to show them the unedited o October 7th footage. Um, but if they have questions, I'm there to answer. If Stella wants to go see where Nova happened, um, I'm going to take her, but of course, with a very tender, um, loving mother approach. Stella's 12. You also have a little son, Ollie, who is? Three. Three. I, I was at the march in Tel Aviv the other day marking the fifth birthday of Ariel Bibas, who has been a hostage for 10 months now. Just horrific to think that there is still a five-year-old hostage and that he was four when this started. And I saw a mother there with two little boys, Ollie's age or younger, walking with them. And I asked her, what are, you, what are you doing here with these kids? She said, look, I'm a single mother. It was either to come here and show solidarity or not to come at all. And I asked her, 
what are you telling them? Like, do, why do they think that they are here? She said, they know that there is a birthday for a little boy who isn't here and he's in trouble. What are you telling Ollie? It's a great question. One of the first um, things that we told him was <clears throat> that because my Ollie loves his crib, he calls it his special crib. Um, and so the way that I could help him understand was there's a, a boy, um, there's a baby, and then there's a boy that's a little bit older than you, and they don't have their special crib. And that made him really upset. He got really angry. You saw his angry face the other night. He got really angry. Um, and uh, so that, you know, he can understand that, that there, you know, he had this, there's a child going to sleep that doesn't have his bed. Um, but, you know, it's, he's three years old. I, I don't know how much he's really processing, but this is the world he's grown up in. You know, a third of his life, his entire family has devoted themselves to advocating and, you know, filming videos every week together. And I'm sure that he's going to grow up knowing that this is who we are. You know, we fight, we take care of each other. Um, and my weapon is my megaphone, my Instagram platform, uh, my videos. So, you know, this is a part, this is, the, I joke with my kids. I'm like, this is the family bi business. Like you're a Savetsky. <laughs> so, you know, this is what we got to do. Well, your, your weapon is your smartphone and your ring light. But this yeah. is a journey that you've been on as a family. And yeah. your husband's weapon is his scalpel. Your <laughs> husband, Dr. Ira Savetsky, I saw has been offering plastic surgery <laughs> yeah. to victims yes. of, of the massacre. Tell me, tell me what he's been doing. Yeah, he's been. Um... So what happened actually was somebody reached out or somebody had posted that there was a guy. Um, this is back in end of October. There was a guy in New York, a young man, who had been beaten up in an anti-Semitic hate crime and had a broken nose. In America? In America. We're not even talking about City. survivors of, of the massacre. We're talking about victims in of anti-Semitism in America. Uh -huh. And somebody tagged my husband in this Instagram post, and he said, send him over. I would love to take care of him, obviously, free of charge. Um, and he had this realization. He's like, look, I, I am not an influencer like you. I'm not, you know, I, I can't go fight in the IDF. He would love to, but he's also, you know, 40. Um, not that that matters, but he, he's not equipped to fight in the IDF. Sorry, Ira. Um, but he, what he could do, what he can contribute is his plastic surgery services. And going into battle with the Botox syringes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So he, um, so he decided that anyone who um, needed any sort of plastic surgery help. Um, he's helped to remove, there was a girl who had a uh, tattoo of a chai on her neck and she didn't feel safe walking around with it. She wanted it removed. So, he, I mean, he's really stepped up. He just operated on a soldier who was in, injured on October 7th. Um, he was uh, fighting at the Nahal Oz base and he was injured while defending the base, defending the people there. Um, so Ira operated on him, um, uh, survivors of Nova, you know, just that's what he feels like he can contribute. And he's really been, his services have been sought after, but there have been people also that are like, I would, you know, I was a victim of an anti-Semitic hate crime, you know, uh, 15 years ago. Can you give me a boob job? <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever it helps, whatever it helps to get over it. Yes. No, but that's, but that's really important that I think since October 7th, we've all been trying to contribute. Yeah in whatever way we can totally. with whatever we with whatever weapons we have and if your weapon is a nice piece of jewelry or your weapon is uh you know is a, is a surgeon's scalpel we're all doing our bit i want to pick your brains specifically as a content creator because you have a phenomenally large platform nearly 400,000 followers on instagram and what i like about your content it's very beautifully made but it's not overproduced. Yeah. It's very authentic, often one shot. You just stick some subtitles and music on it. It's not hours of graphics and it goes wild. I'm wondering, what do you find is effective when you're producing content? Because there are people at home who also want to be influencers. And I say, if you have a smartphone yeah. and everyone has a smartphone, there is no such thing as a non-influencer. So like, what are the basic steps for people who want to start taking their smartphones and with a little bit of investment on some basic equipment from Amazon, 
start becoming an influencer? Well, I'll tell you, I've been here in Israel making all my content with no ring light and no tripod. Um, you really need nothing except for a smartphone with a, and a couple apps, um, which I use the captions app. I use InShot to clip together because a lot of times I'll record it um, like a, a 90 second video and I'll flub one little word and I'll want to restart it. So I use InShot to kind of chop it up. And if I want to add in some visuals, then I'll do that. But I don't even always do that. You don't even really need to. I think about the content that resonates the most with me. And it's not this overly produced content that looks, uh, you know, beautiful cinematography. And that's great. And I think that has a place, but I don't think that that should stop people. If you can't do it at that level, that sh should stop you from also spreading the message. Um, and a lot of times, you know, in our world where I need to get it up, it's breaking news. Mm -hmm. I need to get it out there immediately. And I don't even have time to add pictures over it. So, um, so, you know, and I think that that's often the content that performs the best. I, my tip is, uh, if you can sit across from a window, you don't need a ring light. And I film most of my content in New York, just natural light with a window. Um, and, uh, sometimes I'll script it. Uh, but I think the content of mine that actually performs the best is when I just speak from the heart whether I'm angry, sad, or just sharing information, if I just talk. Because then it pe feels to people like it's a friend. It's not something inaccessible, like some po politician or newscaster. I just want to be Lizzie. And, and I think people, that's what resonates. You're letting people behind the scenes. I found this as well, that the most effective reels are simply one take, just with subtitles, where you invite people behind the scenes and bring them into your world. That's what people are looking to tap yeah. into. Here's what we're thinking right now. And that's why everyone can be an influencer. Anyone. And everyone can use their voice. They don't need to be wearing the snazziest Israeli brands or have thousands of dollars no. of equipment. And everyone should. And I know that not everyone's comfortable uh, producing videos, and I think that's okay. Um, I don't think everyone has to. But if you're being held back because you feel like you don't have the right equipment or you don't have a big enough platform, that's not a, that's not a reason not to do it. How many followers did you have when you started losing followers because of you started I writing had, about Israel? I, I think I, I had shy of or maybe just at 200,000 because I remember I fell under 200,000. And, and, and that growth then, and this is an inspiring note, that growth has been from people who are actually seeking that authentic yeah. connection and speaking about Israel. And that's a sign that actually when you stick your neck out and you fight for Israel's corner and for the Jewish people and for the hostages, you may not end up paying a price. There's actually a, there's actually a dividend to it because uh, people will connect. And I never got into this because of I was looking for followers or a new career path or fame or anything like that. I did it because it... I felt like I had to do it. I felt like I had no choice. Um, it was a responsibility and a calling. Um, but yes, it was amazing to see that over time, the followers, the uh, speaking gigs, the, um, the career path did unfold, even though that's not really what my initial goal was. Amazing. Lizzie, look, your commitment to Israel is beyond doubt. When are we going to see the Sovetskis making Aliyah? It's a topic of conversation that is constant in our house. And um, Stella says that she would really love to finish high school in New York. But I say we're just going to take it one day at a time. And um, I love Tel Aviv. This has been my first time spending more than a week here. And I could definitely see myself living here. And Shabbos dinner at you. You know, <laughs> Well, I was just going to say it was so fun having the whole so Sovetsky family over for Shabbat dinner oh that God. I want you to make Aliyah and then you can come over more regularly. I would love it. I would, and then we can have you back. We can repay you. Deal. <laughs> Lizzie Savetsky, thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of State of a Nation with Lizzie Savetsky. As always, if you enjoy this show, please follow and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, wherever else you get your podcasts. Give us a like, give us a good review, share the episode with friends, tell them that this platform exists. We'll be back soon with more episodes that take you beyond the headlines and between the lines. I'm Elon Levy, and thanks for joining us.